Hi there, it's, it's great to be here. I don't know, um, maybe we need to introduce ourselves. Um, <laughs> you might, we often get confused, so I thought maybe um, you should know who we are. If you, could you stand beside the table? So this is Richard Dawkins, you can tell because he's wearing Converse, okay? <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're very happy that we hope you enjoyed the movie and, uh, and we're happy to, to do this Q&A. And so I, uh, by tradition, I guess I'll moderate, which means I will choose, choose questions. And then we'll, uh, we'll go at it as long as uh, we're allowed. So I think there are microphones. There, there are people with microphones on the side. And so I'll just choose one. And since you're near him, why don't you begin? Um, hello there. Uh, enjoy the film. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Thank you for I've being here. I've written it down. It's a question for you, Lawrence. Uh, religious people like to pick and choose the bits they agree with in the Bible and disregard the bits they don't agree with. The majority of the... What do you think of the majority of the justices of the Supreme Court of the USA who do the same with the Constitution? <laughs> Am I nervous or what? <laughs> Um, well, I think it, I'm, I think thinking of, I'm thinking of the separation of church and state where they say they can pray before council meetings. Well, you know, I, well, it's not really related to, I'll give you my opinion. Um, it often amazes me that there are judges on the Supreme Court who treat the Constitution as if it were like the Bible. That you have to, um, that's a document that's unchanging and doesn't, doesn't reflect the times. And you have to somehow interpret the meaning of the document. And I think um, those, inevitably what happens, in my experience, is that judges do, do the same thing. They pick and choose those aspects that they will, that they will argue are important for, uh, in this particular court, people have decided that what, they, what their decision is in advance and they find an excuse to, to justify it. Certainly, at least in general, four members of, of the Supreme Court in the United States, who, uh, uh, two of whom are devout Catholics at least, one of whom is an idiot, and, um, and uh, the other one is sort of uh, waffling. So uh, it, it, I have a hard time um, uh, um, accepting the wisdom of that court at this particular time. It's obviously political. It's obvi the, the decisions, for the most part, are justified after the fact, just as people try and seek in religion an explanation for something that they believe in in, in the beginning. And um, anyway, but I don't know if that relates to anything. Do you, I don't know if it's different here, Richard. No? Okay. Well, I mean, we don't have a written constitution. But that's it's, it helps a lot if you don't have one, yeah. Um, <laughs> may, uh, why, don't, why don't we do the, this in the front here? This, yeah, you, yeah. Um, hi. Um, well, I enjoyed the film mostly, but it seemed at times that it especially in comparison to some of your earlier publications and earlier documentaries at times that it was a sort of comical straw man. How would you react to that? Comical what was the, the word? Straw man. As in the straw, man. the straw man fallacy. Uh, I think I'd react to that by saying I don't agree. Um, <laughs> well, but I mean, you, you might need to explain a let, bit more. Let, let, me, let me jump in and say, because uh, I know this has come, I've, I've heard a version of this a number of times. People, some people are concerned that um, you know, there wasn't more balance or, or uh, uh, a variety of things. But you have to understand that this is a documentary, that these young men who made the film, who are two very talented young filmmakers, and I, I personally think they did a great job. They were wonderful filmmakers. But they, they followed us around. They didn't pick and choose what was going to happen. And they took 120 hours of footage over about six months in different countries. And, uh, and they used the footage they had. Uh, and, and there's, it also interests me, I'm amazed that, that people, there's a lot of scientific discussions there. That first clip, for example, of our discussion in, in, in Sydney Opera House, or one of the first clips, is like eight minutes long, which in a movie is about as long as you could have for a single scene. But the bottom line is, they, as they put it, and I'll use their words, it sounds self-aggrandizing, but it's their words. Um, they said, if you're making a film about the Beatles, you don't follow the Rolling Stones. And so... Uh, they just took the footage they had, and, and, um, and I think um, um, the, 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 actually, if you look at it, the, 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 the footage they used, and, and, uh, and obviously we've seen it, I think is, is, tends to get people discussing. And in fact, the, for me, at least, the intent of the film is, was, was hopefully to reach people who haven't thought much about these issues. And so far, the reaction has been that it's provoked a lot of discussion after the fact, so I'm very happy with it. But, but is that what you meant? I mean, what did you mean when you, when you thought it was 
a straw man. I think you, need, you can shout it out. It's yeah. okay. It seemed like a lot of the things in there were basically just put in there just to make people laugh. I mean, obviously, you've, you've already answered the preaching to the choir question before, but it did, it did just seem a lot of the things in there were just sort of to sort of say this is religion, make people laugh at it, rather than making people actually think about it. Okay, but uh, well, it wasn't scripted, so that would have all been spontaneous anyway. Um, yeah, okay, well, we need to think about that. Okay, okay let's, uh, let's try near the back. Um, then, oh, you, I did this side, so we should go to this side. Why don't we take way over there, that gentleman in the back, yeah, you. Now makes, that's great, thank you for turning on the lights, now we can actually see. Hi. Um, as an atheist, I was hoping you might be able to help with one of the, a, a paradox that I have in, in my thinking. Um, I think you'd agree that overall religion has a negative effect on the world, overall, although it does have some positive, positive effects. Um, I like many of my thoughts to be based on evidence or empirical, something that's empirically verifiable. Some of the, the positive things and negative things are empirically verifiable, such as you, you could say you know, 300 deaths last year caused by extremists or whatever. But some of these things like, like hope that religion gives to people aren't quantifiable. Um, given that it's not quantifiable, how can you believe something so strongly without empirical evidence? Is that not the antithesis of what we try to, what we try to do? You, you want to start, But it Richard? sounds as though all your thinking is based upon whether it has a good effect or a bad effect. I don't care if it has a good effect or a bad effect. I care if it's true. Agree, yeah. Uh, and because, I mean, as, as scientists, that's what we care about. Um, I didn't actually hear the examples you gave of the good effects. I can think of very, very few good effects indeed. Um, but even if I could, even if everything was good, if there's no evidence that it's true, then I would not accept it. Evidence seems to me to be the right approach when you're looking for what's true. But if you're looking for what's good, then a lot of value judgment comes into it. And I think I'll echo in one sense. The, ma the main thing is that uh, the key thing that I think both Richard and I want to do is excite people about the, the wonders of reality, about the real universe and how amazing it is. And, and, instead of, and, and realize that they don't need this fake universe of myth and superstition. For me, that's what drives me is I think, and, and as an aside, I think people ultimately lo lose religion, but personally, I'm driven more by getting people excited about the real universe. And you might say, and I've had this discussion with at least one or two of the people who were in the beginning and end of the film, one in particular that I know of, whether, you know, if people find solace in something, is it, you know, is it, reasonable or justifiable to argue that, that what they're finding solace in is, is not right. Well, I don't think either Richard or I would go to someone's deathbed who's, who's clinging on that and say, oh, you know, forget it. But, but uh, well, it depends who they are, actually. Um, but, uh, but, um, but, the, but the problem is that it's not innocuous. That, the, that, that, as a, that beliefs, as I think I said in the film, that beliefs in things that aren't true inevitably produce actions which, which are harm, often harmful. And so if it was just innocuous, I, th I think I'd feel a lot less uh, worried about it, but it's not innocuous, and therefore I think it's really important to try and convince people to base their actions on reality. And uh, on the whole, while that may hurt it's some people, on, I think on the whole it leads to a better society. Uh, you, oh yeah, there's people up there. Uh, is there a microphone up there? There will be. There will be? Okay. <laughs> We'll get to you in a second. Okay, you're the next one. Yeah, you, you, you the, the woman who's got his hands up, her hand up. But, but let me, let me go on this side first. I get to play. Um, th this gentleman here with the, um, yes, you, yes, bald and a beard, or semi bald and a beard. I don't know. I can't see from here. Hi. Um, I, I think, um, trying to complete his his question. Um, I see that you guys are scientists getting into the realm of politics, and I completely applaud that, standing applause. But um, my question is, um, don't you think that perhaps uh, you, you, Lawrence, are the scientists of the cosmos, then you, 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 you Richard, are the scientists of the biology, then 
uh, again, you are also the, the scientist of the, of, the, of the very little of the, of the, um, of the atoms, then, then, I don't know, Sam Harris will be the scientist of the, of the brain. But don't you think that there's something missing, there's something in between, which is a social layer that, that, that we, should, we should be applying that kind of science into helping change the society the way you guys want to do it? And there should be, I don't, I, I'm not asking you guys to do it, but... But, but there, there, are, there are social scientists. Richard's a biologist, I'm a cosmologist, a theoretical physicist, and we talk about, we try at least, to talk about things we, we know. And, we, and you're absolutely right, there are other people who have expertise in other things, but that's for them to talk about. I don't, I don't know if you want to... No, no, I'm, I'm just saying that, that perhaps um, his, his question was how to use empirical knowledge and evidence to show, for instance, when it's better to be kind of a little bit more aggressive on the discourse, or when it's better to be a little bit more politically correct, and not just to do it on the spur of the yes, moment. Yes, I, I think it would be very valuable to have research of the kind you, uh, you suggest, which would, be, which would inform our political tactical decisions mm -hmm. on how to influence people. I mean, we could take, go and take a course in public relations and, and, and advertising things like that. Well, neither of us, I think, have ever done that. Um, maybe we should. Uh, that isn't uh, my no, Richard, way. That no, isn't you, my no, way. You shouldn't, Richard. I don't think you should. Um, but, but I think the point is that we, um, it takes, you know, it's like a thousand points of light, as they used to say in my country. Um, I think it takes many different approaches. There isn't one approach that resonates with everyone. And Richard and I have different approaches. And we've as, as we talk about in the movie, we started out, when we first met, we had, I think, much, much different approaches. And, 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 uh, and I think it takes all, all different arguments, different approaches, work with different people. Um, but ultimately, the point that, that, that you should base your actions on empirical evidence and rational thinking is something that it doesn't matter what kind of scientist you are, it doesn't matter what kind of person you are, you don't have to be a scientist to argue for that. And that's the key point. It's not as if it requires scientists. Everyone should be utilizing those things, and the public should be utilizing those things when they choose, in a democracy, apparently, uh, who they elect. And they should require the people they elect to use empirical evidence and rational thinking. So I think that's all, at least that's what we're primarily advocating. I, I once attended a talk by somebody who, who was trying to persuade us not to be, as he put it, don't be a dick. And, um, and he took a vote in his talk. He said, uh, how, how many of you here would be per persuaded that you were wrong if the speaker said, you're an idiot? And not entirely surprisingly, uh, nobody put their hand up. Nobody said that they would be persuaded if they, would, if, if they were told that you're an idiot. I think I would, actually. I mean, I think that... Well, there's that a is... scene in the movie where you say you were. You remember yeah, in that train? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Um, but but th there is another point, which is that sometimes when you're talking to an idiot, it's not the idiot you're trying to persuade, yeah. it's the rest of the audience who are listening to you. Uh, and so um, it isn't necessarily obvious that just because people are not persuaded when you say you're an idiot that, 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 that you shouldn't do that. There's, I think there's a small minority, of which I believe I'm one, who might be persuaded if you told me I was an idiot. Yeah, we, and in fact, there are a few debates in the movie, not that many. Um, both of us have taken part in di discussions. Neither of us like debates. We've been talking about that the last few days. But, but, um, but generally, indeed, the, often the reason I agree to do them, I'm, I'm pretty sure Richard too, is, is you know, that you don't expect the person you're on the stage with to have any impact on them. But it's the vast majority of people who really, again, haven't thought about these issues very much. And, and, and they're the people I think you're trying to appeal to in one way or another. And um, as I say, sometimes it's humor, sometimes it's kicking people in the head. I believe there's a statute in, in common law in England which states that no idiot shall be allowed to stand for Parliament. Really? <laughs> well, how come there's so many people in Parliament? Okay. I think, I think the woman up there, do you have a microphone now? Did you, uh, this, this woman, uh, there, there she is. I think that's it, yeah. Yeah, I think my question is pretty much answered by the last. It was oh. this... I, I suppose just to add to that, I don't, I don't think it's useful for our calls, if we have one, to, to say that there's rational people here and idiots there. And then there's a lot of people in the middle who in are middle, a bit exactly. fuzzy yeah. thinking. And, and perhaps yes. the point is that 
we should be a bit more pragmatic in how we... I, I don't have a question because it was basically answered by the but, previous point, but just to throw that in. But l let me point out that it doesn't even divide that way. I mean, rational people are also idiots. We all are. We all are irrational. And that's one of the things why we have to sort of be skeptical of ourselves. We all, as I've often said, I don't think it's in the movie, we all have to believe 10 impossible things before breakfast just to get up in the morning. You have to believe you love your spouse or you like your work or whatever it is. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and so we're not, we are all human beings, including scientists. And so one of the things that science, I think, usefully teaches you, if you practice it, is to second guess yourself and ask, her, what, why are you making that decision? Why do you believe this result? Is it because you want to believe it or because there's evidence, et cetera? And so, scientific method is, is tailored for that. Yeah. Things yeah. like the double-blind control trial that's so much used in medical research is specifically aimed at not fooling yourself. Because with the best will in the world, uh, scientists are influenced by the result that they want to get. Absolutely. Sometimes in the opposite direction, actually, if they're very, very conscientious. So the best thing is simply not to know, for example, in a medical tr trial, which bottle contains the control, which bottle contains the experimental. Nobody's allowed to know that, so that you cannot be fooled uh, by your own preconceptions. And a good example of working in the other direction, you probably know the study, but there was a study done of, of prayer, the efficacy of prayer. And um, the study was interesting because there were people who, who were prayed for and people who weren't, and there were people who were told they were prayed for. And the people who were told they were paid for did worse. Yes. And, and the idea is that they would put a lot of pressure on them to get better, and, and, and uh, they didn't. Anyway, now let's, let's go here. But keep a microphone up there, because we'll go back. Um, well, why don't we take this gentleman here? Yeah, if you could keep the mic lights up on the audience, it would really help so we could see. So I would like to ask a question uh, that picks, mm -hmm. picks up on what you were just talking about. Um, I wouldn't dare to call any of you idiots, <laughs> uh, but uh, so one of the things you mentioned in the movie, Lawrence, is that uh, there, there are no uh, authorities in science. There should be no uh, authorities. There should be no, no there are, authorities there are, in science. There are, but there should so be, yeah. Max Planck famously claimed that science progresses funeral by funeral, which by which he meant that you know mm -hmm. most new things come into prominence in science, not when uh, people become convinced, but when the old guard die out, Absolutely. as it were. Mm -hmm. And like many people would say that the current state of affairs in science in general is, is quite a sad one with like a, a large number of, of cases of scientific fraud. With some, uh, Mark Hauser was you know, uh, uh, suspended at Harvard. Uh, in social psychology, you have lots of scandals in the field of, of priming where a lot of, uh, uh, there was a case in Holland with this uh, guy that had produced his own data. Uh, a disturbingly large number of results can't be replicated because mm -hmm. people feel well, pressured think, to publish okay. so on. Don't you think that you are often, so this is my question, don't you think that you're often painting a too rosy picture of science? Well, and well, that sometimes that might backfire because then okay. your opponents might look, it might discover cases of scientific fraud and be like, oh, you know, I, but Lawrence Krauss claims, claims that everything, everything is fine. This is now, it's, it looks like it's well, completely Well, you know, different. look, I, I even think the bad cases are good cases. <laughs> I guess maybe I am too optimistic in that sense, but I, I think, first of all, I think it's way overblown. I mean, uh, it, it, there are areas in the pharmaceutical industry in particular, I think we have to worry, there's huge amounts of money and, and I think you have to worry a little bit about the results. In my area of physics, um, it's working very well, thank you. And moreover, it is true that, and it's remarkable that, that um, you know, we assume honesty. And if you're dishonest in science, it's remarkable how you can get through a variety of barriers. But what almost ha always happens, as far as I know, is that is you get found out, is that the community tries to reproduce your experiments and it doesn't work and it's discovered that that result is wrong. So even wrong, look, getting in a journal it doesn't mean anything. It means you got published. But, but it's, the, it's when people reproduce your results and find them useful that it's important. So there's lots of garbage. I don't read most stuff that's in journals because most of it's garbage. Literally, I mean, or at least, or, or it 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 isn't particularly relevant or important. But there are, but it's obvious when there's something that's useful, and then people pick up on that and find out when things are wrong. So even the cases of scientific fraud that I know of in physics, the fact that they get found out is an example of the of the self policing, the importance of peer review. But scientists do, and they're easily fooled by people who lie. The, the, uh, James Randi, who's a who's a friend of art, well, you know, as well, is a, is a wonderful magician um, 
who tries to seek out fraud. And there was a study being done on ESP at Princeton. And um, he trained two of his people to do tricks and go into the study. And, and then he, um, he said, if anyone asks you are, you, are you lying or tricking us, say yes. Okay? And of course, the study was done, and there were, only two, there were two candidates who, who were demonstrated to have ESP, and it was the two. Because scientists never think people are lying. So lying, unfortunately, can get you at a certain stage. But I think, on the whole, the scientific enterprise is doing very, very well. I don't know if you... Uh... Well, the scientific ideal is that fiddling your figures, cheating, is the worst thing you can possibly do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's true that there are individual bad apples who do it, and as Lawrence says, they're usually found out. But science is the one profession where everybody knows that if people fiddle their figures, the whole of science will simply crumble. There's no point in doing science if you fiddle your figures. Other professions, like being a lawyer, for example, you're paid <laughs> to... You're paid to deceive. You're, you're paid to mislead a, a, a jury. I mean, even if you believe somebody is actually guilty, you're paid um, to... Uh, to argue for their for their innocence, that's uh, inconceivable to a to a to a scientist. But but even better, the point is, what's great is that the, what determines what's right is not people. So when you lie and fiddle your figures, what happens is someone tries to reproduce the experiment. It's nature, and so when the experiment isn't reproducible, it gets thrown out. And that's what's wonderful. That's what I mean by the lack of authority. It's true that an individual can le cheat and lie and 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 get ahead at a certain point, but ultimately. It's the science, not the scientists. And the, and the science goes by, by nature. And if the experiments of later people can't reproduce it, then people throw it out. That's what's so great. It's not based on someone's word or oath or, 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 or how many Nobel Prizes they've won. Unfortunately, that rings truer for physics, where you, you expect experiments to be perfectly reproducible. In biology, where it's also complicated and messy, um, if, if an experiment is repeated and doesn't give the same result, that it, it isn't automatically assumed that the, that the first one was cheating. It's assumed that the, there's some complication that was overlooked. So it is more difficult in biology, and it may be, it's probably true, in fact, that there is more fraud, I, I suspect, in medical research. And, and it's harder in social science. That's yeah. why it's, I mean, physics is the, I say it all the time, people think I'm joking, I do physics because it's easy. It's the easiest. And, and all these other things are much harder. And, and that's why we just hit the low-hanging fruit. Um, but we haven't any women recently down here. It's all men. One, one, one in the front. There, there's one. OK, here we go. We'll take this side here. I'm a little bit starstruck. <laughs> um, thank you. And I think that you're both amazing. Um, and you've really inspired me to want to study science. Oh, OK, thank um, you. And uh, evidence suggests that um, the more educated you are, the less religious you become. So I was wondering, would you be doing anything more like the lectures in 1991, you know, the growing up in the universe, this is to Richard. My, my yeah. Christmas lectures? Yeah, they were brilliant. Um, well, yes. Um, I don't think you get invited to give the Christmas lectures more than once unless you're Michael Faraday. Yeah. Um, well, he got to choose again. He, too. he did them, I think, <laughs> I think 19 times. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I don't think that's going to happen. But the idea of giving lectures to what Faraday called a juvenile auditory um, is certainly uh, very appealing. I, I have written a book for, uh, for young people, The Magic of Reality. And uh, certainly, uh, I, I would like to think that I might do another one rather, rather similar. That, that book has 12 chapters, each of which is one question, uh, which is f answered first in myths and then in science. Uh, and I could imagine doing another book with another 10 questions, uh, because there are so many more qu questions to ask. I just found that the, um, the videos you can watch on YouTube are brilliant for adults, not just you, children. You prefer videos to books, yeah. do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Easier to, easy to watch, yeah. but also for um, people in estates and like your jaw blogs next door, just to get it more accessible to... Y yes. Yeah. Well, I, I do think that, that, that videos are I immensely powerful and... Uh, Certainly, it's one of the things that my foundation, especially in America, is, is working towards, is producing uh, lots of videos, including quite short ones, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which can be a, a, possibly a resource for teachers 
to, to splice into a lesson, uh, just a sort of five-minute or three-minute um, vignette on some particular scientific question, perhaps recording somebody like Lawrence talking about a yeah. particular thing. Yeah. Look uh, forward to it. And, and, yeah. Yeah. It, it, and that's, by the way, one of the reasons why we want to do the film, is that, is that you reach people, there's a whole much broader audience, and of course both of us are on YouTube a lot, but, but, um, but I also find, by the way, speaking of these things useful for adults, that if you direct a lecture towards children, it's likely that some adults will understand it. And, uh, <laughs> and so I think that, and I am always been saddened that I think, I'm not certain about this, that I think you have to be British to give the Christmas lectures. I've always wanted to No, do not true. Well, then no. I want to give them sometime, anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay, uh, let's go way in the back, right? That man right there. And then, I don't know, yeah, then we'll go up upstairs again. I'm guessing I'm a bit of a minority here. I'm probably the only rabbi in the room. Um, but I'm a liberal rabbi, which may help a little bit. Um, I was interested in the statement that you made in the film, I can't remember at what point, where that if you don't buy some of the stuff, then you should get rid of it all. And I'm curious to know how that works, because part of the problem, I think, that you're encountering and that is, is, is the polarization of, of what has seemed to be very opposite views, where in fact there is a lot of common ground. Clearly, there is orthodox religion which has fundamental beliefs which are basically nonsense. Um, and there are, but there are plenty of religious beliefs, I think, that can be justified in the context that you're speaking. And in fact, that I think that bringing a liberal religious voice into the conversation would actually help make it a more, a less polarized situation and a more, hopefully, more profitable one. I mean, for example, the statement you just made to the, to the person up there, to, we should value, uh, you should value your life and, and seek to appreciate the fact that you're, that's a religious statement as far as well, I'm concerned. Well, no, it's not a religious statement. It's I not a think. religious statement. No, I disagree with you completely. Okay. Completely. But, but, that's, that, but that, that comes down to a definition of what religion is then. Yeah, well, well yeah. You want, you want. Which I think is the point. I mean, and just as one more thing, I would, but I have in my synagogue, as a, in a sermon, I quoted the 37 adjectives, I think it was, with which Richard describes the Old Testament God in the, the God delusion. Well, because I agree with that. Well, that's the Old Testament God. Of course you do. Because you're, you're a decent man. Of course oh, you, you. you agree with it. Um, but but you, you have to have some criterion for deciding which bits of your scripture you believe and which you don't. Uh, well, interestingly, just one, I'm sorry, I don't want to dominate this, but the, one of the bases of, of liberal Judaism was a, an institution, an organization, an institution that was established in Berlin in the 1870s called the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, the Institute for the Scientific Study of Judaism. So, yeah, well, you I know, don't know what, I'm, I'm, my point I'm, is I'm from a Jewish background, so I'm going to jump yeah, in here. Because yeah. I, yeah, I know so many people hands. who are say, well, you know, I'm, I'm an atheist, but I'm Jewish, and and um, and and because you're allowed to be an atheist if you're Jewish, apparently. And um, and I think the point is that what, what it, the, that book that 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 people read from is one book, and so there are valuable things in many books. But treating it as if it's special, I agree. Just like just like treating Aristotle as if he were special. There's some things that Aristotle got right, a heck of a lot of things he got wrong. But isn't that, and isn't so it's that, not surprising, so monkeys on a typewriter will eventually produce Shakespeare, it's not surprising there's some things in the Bible that are, that are, that are but reasonable. That, but, that's, but, that, but isn't that the point, that you, if there is some of it that you find unreasonable, not unreasonably, because most of it is unreasonable, yeah. because it's 3,000. But rationality probably. should determine what, what you think but is exactly, reasonable. Well, I think that, but there's, I don't think there's an inconsistency there, which is why I, I take exception to the statement, if you don't buy all of it, you should, well, throw, you should throw it all, if you don't but, buy okay, no, some of it, yeah, yeah, you okay, should throw yeah, it all okay. away. Do you see my point? Um, um, you, you, you are saying that there are parts of the Bible which you find reasonable and other parts which I'm saying there are parts of, of religious traditions, whatever they religious might traditions. be, that ha parts, and, and texts. Okay, that there are parts value. that you find reasonable and parts that you, that you don't, and sure. that, that's right. Why bother to bring it back to religion? If you've got an independent criterion for deciding which bits of religion you find reasonable and which you don't, just decide. Don't bother to go... Cut out the middleman of, re of, of religion and just go straight to, to your modern, decent, liberal understanding of what's right and wrong. And that doesn't come from the Bible, or if it does, it's a pure incidental accident. But, yeah. the, but 
if the Bible, if the Bible is perceived, sorry, I, I, sorry, just, if somebody else wants to talk, just shut me up, okay? I don't, it, get, well, throw the rabbi this will be the last comment. Okay, okay. thanks. But the point is that I, my belief is that the Bible and all those religious ideas of thousands of years ago were the science of their day. They were the questions that were being asked and about sure. the nature of the universe. And some of the answers they came up with were complete rubbish but they made sense in the time, and some of them were not. Some of them have lasting value. And I'm not saying that that, gives, that, in, that therefore presumes some divine being that, in, that, that wrote those things. All I'm saying is that it's a testament to human ingenuity, which is the forerunner of science. And I think to dismiss all religion as just being well, some you, kind you, of hocus no, pocus. No, you don't have to dismiss it. You can say that it's historically interesting. You, you can, can say that, yeah. it, that, that, that you, can, you can trace from some of the great religious traditions some of the ideas that we have today. But you don't say that, uh, therefore, I need to be a rabbi or I need to be a, a, a well, can priest. I just, or, okay, my last that comment. point is accepting, you know, you read it critically like any other document. Sure. That's my fine. Last, it's a my, book like yeah, any other book. Read absolutely. it critically and encourage people to read it critically like any other book. And it, it's not, in my mind, there are a lot of better books, but, but it's... Uh, no, no. Yeah. But the, just one, but this is it, I promise. The word rabbi means teacher. End of. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having the courage to bring it up here. Um, over there, that woman over there. In the, in the, uh, yeah. In the film, you... Um you said you believed religion was in its death throes. Do you actually genuinely think we will see a world where religion is totally eradicated and we're all reasonable, rational human beings? And if so, will it be in my lifetime? Are we talking decades, centuries, millennia? There's a difference between hope and expectation. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I think religion is in its death throes in Western Europe at least the Christian and Jewish religions may be. Um, I only wish I could say the same of Islam, um, which seems to me to be one of the great evils of the world and shows no sign of diminishing at present. And um, the great hope would be that uh, we can, um, that, that education can do for the world of, of Islam today what it did for, what, what it's already done for, for um, Christendom. And, and uh, the, there is empirical evidence that it's on the decline. So that there, that's, a, that's undisputed, at least in the, in the Western world. And so I think that that's, uh, that's clear. And it's a function of both science and education. And so what we need to do, and I think the only, uh, I've written about this in, in the Islamic world, is going to be very hard, but education, and particularly education of women. Yeah, yeah. That's the most important thing in the Islamic world, it seems to me, to be able to try and conquer. Because women are the ones who are going to bring up children and in that world. And, and so the suppression of the education of women is the, is, is, the, is the biggest obstacle, I think, to change in that part of the world. And that's why they do it. I'll get you in a second. I see you're jumping in. OK, yeah, exactly. That's why they do it. OK, you. you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here. Thank, here, Carl. Thanks. And then we'll go up there again, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, Professor Dawkins, Professor Kraus, um, as a 15-year-old, uh, I've just got to say that you're a massive inspiration, and I wish that you were my respective biology uh, <laughs> and physics teachers as well. It, was, it would be quite good if you were my RS teacher as well. Um, <laughs> so I've got a question that is a bit Carl Sagan inspired, because I know it's something that he was interested in, especially in his contact film. And, Consider the fact that, uh, I actually word processed it. So. It's all right. <laughs> Consider the fact that despite our best efforts, 84% of the world's population, roughly, associates itself with a religion. If we're ever to make contact or visit an intelligent, intelligent civilization in the cosmos, do you think that religion should play a role in that? Science would allow us to communicate, but do you think that divinity has a right to get involved with complex scientific issues that would affect all of us as the human species? Uh, well, I'll start. Absolutely not. No. No. Um, no. Why? 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 It's like you know, asking a baseball coach to be. I mean, what? Uh, it, it's, I mean, it, it, the point is that science. Um, you know, I me. Mean, if we if we really contacted extraterrestrials, which by the way, um, it's probably not, not going to happen. But uh, um, I think the greatest aspect of that, one hopes, and and this is common in science fiction. 
but one of the things I like about Star Trek is they've moved beyond religion, and, and these primitive societies all have mythological beliefs. But So one, one expects that if one were to contact civilization, the most likely civilization to hear from would be the most advanced one. Okay. And one would hope, in fact, that the great thing is that it would, in fact, serve to help, um, help destroy mythology. And so okay. um, you wouldn't want to blur that, in my opinion. But, but do you think that if we were to look at the human species as a whole, that you have to recognize religion as a historic as eighty four percent of i yeah, an atheist, well, but do do so ideally I would say not. But No, no, think I think you know you want to represent the human species as a human species. If you want to communicate a lot my friend Stephen Hawking says you should just shut up, you shouldn't communicate because <laughs> they'll probably destroy it. But but um <laughs> Uh, but no, I think you want to give an accurate representation of our civilization, civilization and its history. And there's zero doubt that religion, not just today, but throughout all of human history, has played a role. And maybe you could ask them to help out. <laughs> Carl Sagan was very much interested in what we should broadcast to yeah. the universe. As, yeah. as, uh, um, and uh, so he, I think he included some music in his, in his um, which was it? Whale noises as well? The, the, yeah. The, yeah. Um, Lewis Thomas said what we should do to advertise the human species is send Bach, all of Bach, nothing but Bach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we should send science because that's something to be proud of. I sometimes think we should even now actually be sending out what you could call a cosmic tombstone because eventually the human species is going to go extinct, and it would be nice to think that Shakespeare and Bach uh, and Darwin and Einstein, that the achievements of, the, of the, the great humans of history would not die with us. And so sending out a cosmic tombstone um, in the vague, faint, infinitesimal hope that it might one day be picked up. It really is infinitesimal, by the way. Uh, um, I think that that might well be a, a, a worthwhile. The, the good news is we're doing it. Yes. Yeah, because every time we send out radio signals we're, we're, and TV signals, we're doing it, and so there's a, some likelihood, of course, they'll get, well, they'll I get mean, the bad as well as the good. Yes, the indeed. Yeah. indeed. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in Carl Sagan's con contact, the, the very first human signal that was received from, from in, in, in outer space was Hitler's speech yeah. Hitler. <laughs> yeah. opening right. the Olympic Games. Um, in whatever it was, 1938. Yeah, it was the first uh, broadcast. Yeah. yeah, so exactly. Okay, let's see. All the way back. Are you? You have a microphone. Yeah, all the way back there. Though, yeah. No, no, not you. Don't unless you want to jump. It's no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi guys. Um, thanks for coming tonight. It's really, really exciting. Um, I just wanted to go back to y your books uh, that you mentioned earlier about. Uh, with children um, and take it a little bit younger because your, your Magic of Reality book, Richard, is fantastic uh, and I've given it to many a parent who's, who's approached me about how to talk to their kids about uh, religion because they're not sort of quite sure how to have it if their kids go to C of E schools or Catholic schools uh, but they don't necessarily believe in God. Um, and I wondered if there were any plans to go a little bit younger because although that book's fantastic for you know, atheist or agnostic parents who want to have that discussion, um, a lot of kids are already indoctrinated by that point because they're in a society that is mm -hmm. predominantly religious. And when there are so many toys and books and things about Noah's Ark and all the sort of crap that you get in the Bible and all that type of stuff, is there any plans, for example, from the Richard Dawkins Foundation or anything like that to go a little bit younger so that it's in the mainstream earlier? Well, I think that's a, a, a very good idea. By the way, The Magic of Reality is not an anti-religious book. It's a, it's a it's warm, a science, purely yeah. scientific book. Um, I once went into W.H. Smith and did a survey. I counted the number of children's books which are really religious propaganda. And they're huge numbers. I mean, gigantic numbers of them. Uh, and so, yes, I, I, I wouldn't mind producing an, a more um, overtly atheistic book for, for children. Um, there's a problem, it might not sell very well if, <laughs> if it was called Atheism for Tiny Tots or <laughs> something, something like that. Um, it's got maybe to be on if you gave up to candy chance. along with it, it would be a good thing. Um, but uh, but I, I think probably the, the better approach is, is to, to do it as, as a science book mm -hmm. uh, and to, um, to discuss science in a very uh, skeptical way. 
and and so that that I, I think that is a very good thing to do and and I would like to do it, yes. But we, we do need, I mean, as you point out, the, there, there are a bunch of books for teens and young adults, and, 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 but, but we, we do, and I, I've, off, I've thought about it too, and I've talked to some people about doing some books for, for very young kids with an artist, and I think we need to do that more. Uh, because, ki- but, because kids are extremely receptive to that kind of thing. And, uh, but it, it, it requires, it's true, it's a very different kind of, uh, writing and publishing experience and requires some expertise and, and, and working with the right people. They are, they're, they're also really, really heavily indoctrinated by that point. I remember a program you did, Richard, a few years ago, I can't remember what it was called, but where you did some, um, you were looking for fossils on a beach with some kids, um, and at the end of it, almost all of them reverted back to, despite the fact you talked through some really sensible science with them, most of them sort of said, oh yeah, no, but my God, you know, my, my, my parents still said that uh, God exists and blah, 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 so... It, they're so heavily indoctrinated by that point that it's, it's, you know, we need to sort of almost flood the market with, with um, some really young kids stuff because they're really heavily indoctrinated by that point, especially in this country and, it, and even more so in the States. Although that, the problem with the indoctrination is it's often done by parents and they're the ones who buy the kids the books. Um, that's why we need, we, need, we need good education. I mean, we really, the, I've just read, written a piece which I hope will appear in the Times, in the New York Times, but uh, that we, the purpose of education in the school in the school should be to get kids to not believe what their parents tell them. I think, and uh, and that's a big or what they hear from their anyone else, but to get them to be skeptical. And so we really need to be. We that is why it discourages me so much that people can take in some sense can take their kids out of school, and, uh, because of course schools a lot of schools are bad. But but really we need to be able to provide those kids an opportunity to get away from the home in many cases. I wonder how many parents who teach children, their children, things like the Adam and Eve story, don't really believe it themselves, but just think it's a charming, sweet story um, and, and part of you know, what one does tell yeah. children. Perhaps a, a consciousness-raising exercise for parents, saying, yeah. think twice before you uh, simply automatically pass on to your children the charming stories of Adam and Eve. Noah, of course, is not a charming story, um, but it still gets passed on uh, because it's the animals going in two by two is yeah. a sort of p- nice picture. Um, but perhaps parents who actually don't for a moment believe in the stories that they tell children just sort of tell them the same way they tell them about Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. Um, uh, and children eventually grow out of those stories, but then they find they don't grow up, out, grow out of, the, of the Bible stories they get told. Yeah, because the parents act like they're true. But where yeah. they, in fact, in that regard, and this is really interesting, it was all, another thing in the article I was written, it's, maybe we could tell parents how bad it is, because there's now studies, there's a bunch of studies that show, and one that I found very compelling in the United States recently, that show the kids who have a religious education um, have a much harder time distinguishing fact from fiction when they're children. And, they're, and, and this is a really rigorous study, and it's kind of amazing. And I think if we, in some sense, explain to parents that they were really abusing their children, then maybe a lot of parents wouldn't do, do it. Okay. Uh, well, I promised you, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. So. I hope it's a good question, because I come back. <laughs> Pressure. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, but then I've sort of like got other thoughts now. But one thing is that in the East and the West, where you say Islam is now um, sort of um, increasing in its power, and being from Pakistan, I think it's because education is very um, tailored and there's their blasphemy law, so you can't question it and people will shoot you and they've banned YouTube in Pakistan, you know, for example. So these are the things. So I think, you know, there needs to be a drive to stop, I don't know, funding in the, in the East if they have these laws, like a blasphemy law needs to be eradicated, and that's what stops debate in the East, in all of these countries. That's one point, that was just a point. The other thing I just want to say, I thought that, you know, as you become more educated and intellectual, um, you know, you would move away from religion. But then I've seen your other debates and I've seen scientists debate with you and they believe in, you know, they are God believers. And it just doesn't make sense. And is it some sort of an instinct? So 
I'd like your views on that. And just the third thing, and that's for Richard. Maybe we'll just take two. Just okay. Richard, just last thing. Why aren't faith-based schools banned in this country? Why do we have faith-based schools in the advanced nation? The, the official excuse for faith-based schools is that they get good results, and the reason they get good results is that, they're, is that they're, they're known to get good results for historical reasons, and so parents fight to get their children in, uh, and even lie about religious uh, persuasion in order to get their, their children in. Um, the situation in places like Pakistan is dire, as you say, and it's, it's, it's not, in a way not up to, up to, to us here, but, but um, uh, you... you um, Pe people from P Pakistan have a very, very difficult, difficult time of it uh, be because of that. Um, what was the second one? That, um... I think there, uh, I can hit okay, on that. Was ahead. about the scientists and, and that, yeah. that, you know, it's unfortunate. You see, and journalists do it all the time, and, and because they always think there's two sides to every issue. So you get, you know, you have people talking about evolution of the Big Bang or climate change, and they can always find anyone with a PhD to say anything about anything. And then they present one person, they say, well, you know, see, there's a controversy. And that's, they don't understand that, that, that I often tell the journalists, and journalists think there's two sides to every story, but in science, one side is usually wrong. And the problem, but the, but the fact is, and what people have to realize is that scientists are people. First of all, it's very difficult to overcome religious education. It's, for many people, it's introduced when they're children, before they can think rationally and deeply, and it's very hard to get rid of it. So there are a lot of scientists who are, who are religious, probably because they were brought up religious. But, there are, but the, the point is that, the, as I often say, there are scientists who are Republican. There's no, there's no accounting for taste. There's no, or intelligence. So scientists are, are people as well as scientists, and that means they're irrational as well as rational. And so you got to, you're going to expect a, a spectrum. When it comes outside the science, you can expect a spectrum of views, some of which are reasonable and some of which aren't. Uh, there are it's lots of scientists who, who say that they are religious. If you actually cross-question them and say, what do you in fact believe? Mm -hmm. Which religion are you? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin and rose from the dead? Almost certainly the answer is no. They are spiritual. So am I, so is Lawrence. Uh, we may not use the word spiritual, but we get a kind of uplifted feeling when we look up at the stars, when we contemplate the great distances of space, when we contemplate the complexity of life. Um, there are people who will say, oh, well, that's religion. Well, you're playing with words there, and it's very misleading if people take from that, okay, here's a scientist who's, who's religious. So they then assume that the scientist believes in something supernatural, when all he really believes in is uh, what Einstein believed in. The God of Spinoza, the yes. order in the universe. Um, so, uh, so really religious scientists are actually quite rare, and we know how rare they are, because surveys have been done of both the National Academy of Sciences in America and the Royal Society here. And in both cases, it's somewhat, somewhere under 10% uh, who actually do believe in, in, a, in a religion in the true sense of the word. And as uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has said, we really need to worry about that 10%. Um, you know, what's going on in their, in their minds? Uh, but they still are only 10%. And so um, when journalists, as Lawrence says, say that, oh, well, in order to have balance, we must have this side and on, on the other side, sometimes the balance is, uh, is artificial. I forget who it was, it said, when uh, two opposite points of view are put with equal vigor, the truth doesn't lie halfway between. One of them is probably actually wrong. Okay, I, I would add to that, but we only have time for one more question, I think, so I've been told. So who has the best question? <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. Oh, the young, oh yes, absolutely. There we go, I didn't see her. There you go. Uh, hello. Um, Hi. Uh, when I'm older, I wanna be a scientist, but the thing I'm wondering is what's better to be a biologist or a physicist? I know what I'm going to say. Well, it's, it, it, it's clearly better to be a physicist because you're real. If, if you're a physicist, you can do biology. Um, anyway. <laughs> 
the, wor <laughs> the world is full of physicists who think they can do biology. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you know what you should do? You should do what you like to do. That's right. And that's what you yeah. should do. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both very much and thank you also to all the volunteers. There's been a lot of people scurrying around behind the scenes tonight who have helped make this evening for you, so thank you very much to them. Florence and Richard will have a signing table outside, so um, they're happy to sign stuff for you. You might have noticed there's a lot of you, so please, we'd like to restrict this to one DVD and one book each. Um, if you've brought your whole back catalogue and your whole library here, I'm sorry the lumbago has been for nothing. Um, just one DVD and one book, please. And also, just in, in, the, uh, in, in the way of getting people home in a timely fashion, please, no photographs or selfies. Another very important fact about this is that this evening we have actually raised a little bit of extra money to help keep the Skeptic Mag going. Um, Lawrence and Richard haven't received any money for this. They've been happy for the Unbelievers message to get out there. In addition, with the extra money we have made, they have nominated charitable... Uh, groups of their own. Um, £250 will be going to Medicine Sans Frontier on behalf of Lawrence, and 